Hello and welcome to today's expert webinar presented by Accountants World. Our speaker today is Joel Sinkin, President of Transition Advisors, and he'll be speaking on CPA firm mergers and acquisitions in 2019. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, my name is Div Mansali. I'm a Vice President at Accountants World. Um, thrilled to be here with you today and, uh, and to have our old friend Joel Sinkin back with us. Um, presenting on a topic that he knows better than anyone out there. Before we get to Joel, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items here. If you don't see the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, you can look for the orange arrow that allow you to expand or hide the panel at any time. If you want to check out your audio options, click on the audio tab and then you can select computer audio or phone call. And if you select phone call, it'll provide you with a dial-in number and access code. <coughs> and finally, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, you can send those in at any time on the questions tab. Joel will be answering most of the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so just sit tight and we will get to all the questions that come in. And also just a reminder, if you haven't downloaded his presentation PDF, you can do that under the handouts tab as well. Um, before I turn things over to Joel, I just wanted to mention we have uh, we've got some really exciting content uh, that we've just put up recently on our blog. Um, Stephen Brewer, who's a CPA out of Indiana, um, wrote a case study about how his firm has achieved 75% 75, 75 revenue growth over the past five years without needing to change his overall number of clients. Um, and he talks a little bit about how his accounting practice used to be significantly less efficient and less profitable. A lot of their work was desktop write-up and they'd have to wait for clients to bring in their monthly work. And if it was late, it might be days or weeks behind. It was very manual and we had very little control. I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Um, they switched over to the fully 100% web-based accounting power solution. Uh, it gave them more functionality than their desktop uh, program. They could give clients specific access to the bookkeeping modules depending on their level of ability and need. And as soon as they were finished with the bookkeeping, uh, Steve's firm had access to all of the data so they could do their work because it's all in one unified system there. So uh, there's a lot more from Steve on some of the changes he's made in terms of processes and uh, and how he thinks about staffing and, and clients uh, along the way. So I encourage you to go ahead and read Steven's full case study. You can find it at accountantsworld.blog. Instead of .com, we are at .blog for this case study. So accountantsworld.blog. You'll see Stephen's uh, case study right up at the top there. Before I turn it over to Joel, just a brief introduction. As I mentioned, Joel is the president of Transition Advisors, LLC, a leader in practice evaluation, succession planning, and transaction structure. And Steve, uh, and excuse me, Joel has been selected as one of the top 100 most influential people in accounting by Accounting Today. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce and turn it over to Joel Sinkin. Thank you very much, Div. I assume we'll get that share my screen. There we go. And we should hopefully be up. Are we there? Yes, we are. And do you want me to go ahead with the first poll question or do you want to do an intro first? Uh, I think it'd be great to get the first polling question out of the way so we can get into the good stuff. Sounds good. So folks, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the first poll question right now, and this is just to give Joel some background. How many equity partners do you have in your firm? One, two to four, five to nine, 10 to 19, or 20 plus? And so if you can go ahead and select one of those options and then make sure to click the submit button, just a reminder, this is the first of three poll questions that we'll be having today, and poll questions are required in order to earn CPE credit. And so I see most of you have voted at this point. We'll give about 10 seconds for folks who have not yet gotten their vote in. All right, so we are going once, going twice, and I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. 
so Joel, we see uh, over two thirds of people have one equity partner in their firm, uh, and then the majority of the remainder have two to four. Excuse me, very good. First, let me apologize. Not only do I have that New York nasally sound to begin with, but with a cold, it must be extra obnoxious to you all. I'll do the best I can. Um, the polling of the size of the firms is pretty typical to the profession. There are 45,000 CPA firms that are members of the AICPA, 33,000 are sole practitioners, and the overwhelming majority of the rest of them are two to four partner firms. So we represent the bulk of the community today on today's call. Um, to, we're gonna be focusing today on trends that, uh, that we're seeing in the marketplace for the mergers and acquisitions of CPA firms. I've been doing this since 1990, and for the first 25 years, things were pretty much the same, little variances in how you valued and structured, but the last few years, and especially this year, we're seeing things that we've never seen before. We're gonna try and bring light to that. I, I never believe that a CPE session should be an infomercial about your company, but I do think it's important to have a perspective of the speaker. As I mentioned earlier, for the last 29 years, the only thing I've done is help CPA firms with growth and succession strategies through mergers and acquisitions. I've been involved in over 800 closings of accounting firms. So I'll be able to share with you benchmarks and things that probably can't, cannot be matched by most other sources. Unfortunately, you're speaking to us in 2019 because we made so many mistakes and saw so many mistakes that we tried not to make the same one twice. So all those errors turned into some product knowledge now. One of the most driving factors for the last bunch of years in the mergers and acquisition world is succession. I mean, realistically, there's only three ways to grow an accounting firm to begin with. One way is organic growth. One way is adding a marketable niche to cross-sell services. And the only other way of doing it quickly is through a merger. So driving this M&A world, there are other drivers that we're gonna to speak to today about, but a very significant part of the baby boomers are reaching the point in time where succession is very much on the radar. According to a PCPS survey, nearly 80% of the firms that were surveyed expect succession to be a big issue over the next 10 years. So where I wanted to begin is where you should begin. So for all of you that are considering what time you should start your succession, let's, do, let's talk a little bit about that plan right now. You know, let's start with why do you have your clients? You know, most of your clients have no idea if you're competent or incompetent, because if they knew that much to measure your technical skills, unless there was an audit involved, they could do the work themselves. So why are you their accountant? They trust you. You're their most trusted business advisor. It's a bit of blind faith. They don't have that yardstick to measure you by, but you have them because of partner loyalty. So it, now to, we understand that these clients are partner loyal, let's get back to when to start the process. In 1990, when I first started doing this, most of small firms like the bulk of you are on, on this call today, they went out every month a quarter to see their clients, they did the work there, they signed it, they wrote the check, the client signed it and they left. We were in our client's face all the time. Welcome to 2019. If you're not on the cloud, you should be. But we're communicating with our clients in more ways than we ever have before between the cloud and email, staff stopping by, phone calls. But we've spent less time than we've ever done before physically in the same room with our clients. An Accounting Today survey suggested that over 85% of accounting firm clients are only in the same room with their account, the partner that manages them once a year. So if you say to me, you're three years from slowing down, I've got a lot of time to plan, I want you to think of that not as three years, but as three visits. And the 13th Amendment prevents slavery, you can't buy and sell people. So because of this partner loyal practice, because of the limited times we're physically in the same room with the client, because we surely can't transition them through the cloud, it takes a longer period of time to structure a transition plan that ensures client retention. It takes a minimum of three to five years to transition the practice thoroughly 
and the process usually begins well before that. So procrastination of succession planning could be a very dangerous thing, especially in today's market for reasons we'll go over. The Rosenberg survey and the 2018 numbers just came out and I didn't have a chance to convert it to, to be here, but tells us that over 60% of partners are over age 50. This is a very daunting number and the 2018 number showed another increase. Now, we own our practices. We should have the latitude to slow down when we see fit. But the idea of the fact that the majority of us are reaching the point that, that we're soon to be eligible for Social Security tells us the planning needs to begin and we need to start the process. And what it also tells us is there are many people in the same situation, which means that the practices available are more numerous now than they have in the past. Which brings us to the question, is it a buyer or seller's marketplace? For most of the, my career in consulting in M&A of CPA firms, it was always a very much a seller's marketplace. And in certain windows, it still can be. So how do you determine if it's a buyer or seller's marketplace? Well, let's start with location. If I'm speaking to you today from Nassau County, Long Island, in this one county, there are 3,200 CPA firms. There are more CPA firms in Nassau County, New York, than there are in Manhattan. There's more CPAs in Manhattan, but there's more CPA firms in Nassau. So if you have a small three, four $400,000 practice and you're in Nassau County, you're in Bethesda, Maryland, you're in Chicago, Boston, on and on of major population areas, there are so many practices that can absorb a small practice with little to no incremental increases in overhead, it's still a seller's marketplace for a small firm in a densely populated part of the country. Doesn't mean the values are what they used to be. Values have come down, which we'll continue to talk about today. But the ability to find a successor firm exists. If you're three hours outside of Boise, Idaho, you might be in some of the most beautiful country we have in the States, but you also might have one accountant per zip code. In these areas, it's very much a buyer's marketplace. When there's a small pool of potential successor firms, supply and demand takes over, and it's a buyer's marketplace. Where the greatest change has occurred and continues to occur is in larger firms. Let's look at an area, a metropolitan area like Boston. Boston has over 40 firms between 3 and 10 million, but they only have about four firms that are local firms in Boston big enough to take over a $10 million firm. Yet of those 40, 43 practices that fit that range of 3 to 10 million, statistically 50% of them don't have the talent on the bench to execute an internal succession plan. So that means 20 or more of these firms are going to be forced into looking to merge up in order to accomplish succession for the, the partners and growth for those that want to stay on. But yet there's only a handful of buyers to do it. In these places, it's very much a buyer's marketplace. As you increase in revenue, you usually need a firm at least three to five times your size to be able to take you on. You lose the amount of opportunities that it shrinks. So if you're a small firm in a densely populated part of the country, it's a seller's marketplace. If you're in a sparsely populated area or you're a larger firm, it's very much a buyer's marketplace. What changes that is if you have good marketable niches. I just came back from speaking at the AICPA Engage Conference where I also was part of the thought leaders. And the constant message that was brought out was that technology was going to be replacing a lot of the traditional functions of being an accountant. A AI, blockchain, data analytics, bots, all these new technologies, not tomorrow, but anywhere from the next three to seven years are gonna have a dramatic impact on reducing fees we generate from traditional accounting services. If you've developed adv advisory services, where instead of just doing the audit and saying what the audit reveals, 
but getting into the details of what it all means and how does that place in the marketplace and become an advisor as opposed to just a compliance person. If you have that in your practice now, or you have clients that lend themselves to cross-selling of these niches, it will give you an edge in the marketplace and maybe even in a buyer's marketplace, make you a little more attractive. But those who are doing the traditional services some of them are going to be in trouble in valuations because certain firms who are sitting there saying, well, I have a practitioner who came to me, they want to work three more years full-time, then start their buyout, are wondering whether at the end of eight years after the merger and the buyout period, how many clients will still be needing the traditional services. This is another thing that's influencing the valuation of accounting. So five years from now, or if we project out five years from now, a practice that's being eaten up by technology is obviously going to be less appealing than something else. So values have definitely dropped. I, I teach a class on how to value an accounting firm, and when I teach it, everybody comes with three questions. What is the multiple? What is the multiple? And what is the multiple? Well, the multiple is the effect, and if we have time, we'll speak to this a little bit. But generally speaking, values have come down. You very rarely see practices going over one time these days, very rarely. It has to be exception, uh, exceptional practice or very favorable terms like very long payout period, very little to no money up front, no goodwill, long retention periods, things of that. So the market has shifted more so now than ever in the history of the profession. A minor influence on this and a trend that has an impact in M&A is the tremendous increase in amount of staff that are working remotely. It's enabled people to staff up a little easier now than they were able to in the recent past. It also helps when you acquire or merge in a firm. And let's say the two offices are 30 minutes apart. Ultimately, we want to get under one roof. But some people now have a very long commute. And in order to retain them, giving them the ability to work remotely on occasion, can save certain staff, create certain continuity in the practice, in the merger practice, by retaining the people that work the practice that the clients have gotten to know. So remote access, which has its own history and its own future, actually has a minor impact in the M&A world. One of the biggest changes that we're seeing in the accounting profession is the emphasis on merging in non-traditional CPA firms. Barry Melanson, the, the CEO and president of the AICPA, recently was quoted as saying that one-third of the mergers and acquisitions that occurred in 2018 by larger firms were actually non-CPA firm acquisitions by CPA firms. We've seen it. If, we see, if you see accounting today's and accounting world's blast, sharing information about deals that were done, You'll see constantly about the cybersecurity firm that was just acquired by a CPA firm, a wealth management, an HR department. So we're starting to see the accountants who are realizing that they need to add this advisory services choose to do so through a merger or an acquisition. The main niche, niches that we're starting to see, a lot of them revolve around IT cybersecurity, managed services, consulting on hardware and software. A big one, as I mentioned earlier, is data analytics. We're starting to re revisit the interest of firms in developing wealth management and financial services. Newer interest in having an HR department, outsourced CFO, litigation support, forensic accounting, business valuations. Today's focus is leaving the traditional compliance side and focusing on these niche mergers. The, a, a huge impact, again, on some of the multi-partner firm deals and starting to creep into the sole practitioner deals are firms that are merging up not for succession, but for growth. The, the problem that a lot of firms are facing is they haven't embraced technology to the degree that they needed to. And in order to get onto the right platform of technology, the expenses can be great. Accounting world can help direct you and, and save you a lot of mistakes. But many people who are looking to get onto that right platform realize that they don't know what they don't know. So some of them have elected to merge with a larger firm who's already there to avoid making a mistake. 
to get involved with a firm that's already gone through training on how to manage this new platform of technology. So a reason that a lot of firms merge isn't just succession anymore, but there's two other big driving factors. One, to get on top of your technology and join a team that is already there or hire great consultants to help you get there. And the second one is the addition of advisory services. Recently, I had a firm that merged into a larger firm. It was a three partner firm. And in the very first year, they experienced 38% growth. The reason, the successor firm had an estate and trust division, had a cybersecurity division, had an HR consulting division. And when an accountant says to a client, I think you need to sit down with Jane, Jane and John Doe, who handled this niche for us, it's an automatic meeting. So as I mentioned earlier, the biggest reason that we're seeing merges is still succession. But right behind it is the desire to get on top of the IT platform and to join a firm that has advisory services to set up cross-selling of, of these systems. The tricky part is how to structure these deals which these, with these niche practices. One of the problems that you have is, for example, if you look to merge in or acquire a cybersecurity company, a cybersecurity company buying another cybersecurity company is going to value it much higher than an accounting firm. Same with wealth management. A wealth management practice will often get two to three times gross. An accounting firm won't get close to that and won't offer close to that. So structuring these deals could be very tricky in the merger world. First of all, as small firms go, one of the options is not even to do a merger, but to do a joint venture with a firm that's doing a niche that you think you could cross sell well. But if you can do a merger, here's how some of the mergers we've been involved in in the cyber, IT, HR worlds have done. Basically, we, the way we structured it, or explained it is, let's take a cybersecurity firm as an example of a niche merger. We went to the cybersecurity firm and said to them, if you get in front of somebody who needs your service, how is your conversion rate of turning them into a client? And they expressed great confidence that if they're in front of someone who needs their services, they'll generate and turn that into a client. The problem is fighting through the noise to get to that client. But what we taught them was a merger with a CPA firm eliminates that issue. If the partner of a CPA firm says to a client, you, you will have some exposure that we need to take care of, you need to see these people, it's an automatic in the door. So usually the way we'll structure a cybersecurity firm is we'll say, let's say they're doing a million dollars and they're net, net, netting 300 grand. We say, hey, we're going to keep your whole in income as long as your revenue and time commitment stays the same. But we're going to access you to our clients. So what we really need to focus on is how are we going to share in the growth? Everybody should be satisfied that they're getting some value for their time and their relationships. Then the question becomes, do we create a separate entity? For example, on a large firm basis, when Witham acquired a, a cybersecurity firm to us, they created Witham Cybersecurity Division. Do we create a separate entity? Do they become a partner in the firm? If they become a partner in the firm, then they'll be entitled to some sort of buyout 5, 10, 20 years into the future when they leave. So structuring a niche merger is usually keeping the niche whole in income and negotiating how to share in the new revenue generated. Did, why don't we knock out that second polling question So we, since we're about to switch topics a little bit. All right, sounds great. So folks, I'm gonna be launching the second poll question right now. Uh, and so the question in front of you is, what issues do you see affecting your practice most in the next year? And you've got four options plus a fifth one for all of the above. So go ahead and select whichever one applies to you. Make sure to click the submit button. And just a reminder, this is the second of three polling questions that is required in order to earn CP credit for today's webinar. Um, and Joel, if you don't mind, while we're waiting for people to come in, a, a question uh, or people to vote, a question just came in. Is it okay sure. if I go ahead and ask it right now? All right. Absolutely. Don, 
Don asks, wouldn't merging an accounting firm with the securities firm be a conflict of interest? You know, um, there's very different perspectives on this. Uh, if you look at some of the largest CPA firms in the country, they have over a billion dollars of assets under management. So they didn't feel it was a conflict. A lot of it depends on what state you're in, what philosophy you have, and how you handle it. If you're giving full disclosure to a client of how you're receiving your compensation, most people don't feel there's a conflict between adding a wealth management team firm into your accounting practice, as long as you have proper licenses. And most, men, most of the time, it's a separate division as well. The key in most cases, and each state has different regulations and you need to check your own state, but in most cases, as far as the AICPA and most state societies are concerned, it's about disclosure. Hey, um, if, if I'm getting a commission or I'm managing your assets under management and I'm charging you one or two percent of what you carry, in which case I'm not getting commissions as well. So it's all about having an openness and sharing the information. All right, great. Um, so, folks, we'll take uh, just a few last seconds. If you haven't voted yet, please go ahead and do so as soon as possible. All right. And hey, Tim. We're going to close it. Yep. You're starting to get a little bit of feedback on your microphone. Uh, so, if you wouldn't mind, I'll read the uh, answers to the poll questions here. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, folks, it's Tom Provine. I'm a marketing coordinator here at Accountants World. Uh, just kind of sitting in the background here, but I will answer uh, the poll question. So what issues do you see affecting your practice most in the next year? Uh, Joel, it looks like the succession and need for growth are the uh, ones that got the most answers along with all of the above. Uh, people think all of these issues are really going to affect their practice. Do you see that and do you agree? Uh, I completely agree. And what a lot of people find hard to understand is how someone could be looking for both. But many firms are looking for both. If I'm a sole practitioner, I want to work five more years. Maybe I want to aggressively grow my practice over the next five years before I start to slow down. But the most classic example, which we're going to talk to today, is a multi-partner firm where maybe one's ready to retire tomorrow, one's ready to slow down, and one is 45 years old and wants to work 20 more years but lacks the capacity to replace the people leaving. So succession and growth are the main issues that we visit in M&A, and we'll try and address both of them in the, in the rest of today's session. There are certain things you can do to make your firm more attractive for merger or sale. It says 2018, and apologize, 2019. First one is embracing technology. I keep coming back to technology, not just, it doesn't require a merger to get there. You could bring in consultants like Accountants World and other places that can get you to where you need to be. This, uh, when you're going to merge your practice up or sell your practice, they're not as worried about what platform you're on, what specific technology you're using. They want to make sure you're using something. I'll give you a great example. I had a firm just a couple of weeks ago down in Florida who went in and met with a practitioner who was looking to sell their practice. Uh, it was a two-partner firm, actually. And as they walked in, it was still piles of paper left over from tax season everywhere. And they were polite. They spoke for a little bit. They left and called me up and said, I'd never be interested in doing a deal with them. And I asked why. And they said, well, there's paper all over the office. So because I'm cheap, I assume that's because if it's going to cost about $12,000 a head on average to get someone onto the right technology platform, maybe they didn't want to spend the money. He said it has nothing to do with the money. He said, it's a cultural thing. It took me five years to get my team to throw out the paper and get paperless, to take a step backwards again and go through that again, I'm unwilling to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's very important that if you're looking to merge up, if you're looking to do, sell your practice, that you've embraced technology, you've welcomed it, you're on the cloud. Other things you can do that are very hard for small firms to do in some ways, but can be done occasionally, is trying to get away from being 100% partner loyal and trying to become more brand loyal. What I mean by that is if the firm only will speak to one person and only one person, as a successor firm, I'm concerned about the ability to retain that client. I was teaching, while teaching in uh, Las Vegas recently, someone raised their hand and said, 
my practice is so great, nobody could keep my clients if I'm not there. And I said, so your practice is worthless. He said, no, no, that's how great it is. I said, no, if nobody could keep your clients if you're not there, why would I buy your practice? So getting clients used to dealing with another partner occasionally, getting clients used to dealing with other staff members occasionally, they're still going to be predominantly partner loyal in a small firm. But if they're used to speaking to more than one person, it makes your practice more attractive. Having trained clients that get you information on a regular, on an appropriate time frame, that pay their fees on an appropriate time frame, and understanding the real metrics of your own firm. I can't tell you how many times for these one to three, four partner firms, I'll, they'll have impeccable records of their clients, and I'll ask them what was their net last year, and they'll say to me whatever was left. I said, what does that mean? Well, I paid all my bills. Whatever was left, I kept. That's not going to be a really good answer to give a firm that's looking to merge or acquire you. So understanding your metrics. And let me give you another real-life example. A lot of small firms are doing value billing, retainer billing, but they're not keeping track of their records. They feel they, their time, rather. They feel they don't have to worry about their time because they're not charging based on time. They're charging based on the, a retainer or a value-added billing process. But a successful firm wants to know what level of staff you needed and what time and effort it took to retain the client, to, to get the work done, rather. So understanding your real metrics of your realization rates and things like that is very important in getting your house in order. Having realistic terms. You, as accountants, there's over 100 people on the phone with us today. I, I would venture to say that thousands of people have been helped by you on to decide to buy a business. Have you ever gone to a client and said, I just did my due diligence based on the terms you had suggested that you that the seller asked for? You'll lose money for five years if you do this deal. It's a great deal. Do it. Of course not. If you're going to buy a business or you're going to buy a practice, it should be cash flow positive. So while a seller should be well paid for the years of sweat equity and should never be Santa Claus, a practice is a real asset that has a true value. People aren't going to go cash flow negative to buy your practice. It's got to make sense. Having good youthful staff and having advisory services or clients that lend themselves to, client, to advisory services, these are some of the things you could do to make your firm more attractive. So if I'm a seller, let's be even more specific. What, the buyer is going to look at your clients. What kind of growth potential do they have? How old are they? Are they about to leave? If they're a family-oriented business, am I doing the children or just the parents on their tax returns? How well-trained are they are? And one of the big mistakes that people make is they don't know how to look at rates or profitability. And let me explain what I mean by that. When, when a CVA goes to value a business, they value the business based on the profitability of the business being sold or being valued. As an accounting firm, I barely look at that. And I know that sounds strange, but let me give you an example. Let's say I had a small $300,000 practice. I was operating out of my house. My wife, Kathy, answered the phone. What was my net? 85%? Then she was tired of people coming to the house. I took an office. She didn't come with me. I hired an office manager. I had rent. And now I'm netting 40%. At which point in time was my practice worth more to you? It's irrelevant. If you could absorb my practice with no incremental increases in overhead, it's a very profitable acquisition. If I say you have to keep my lease, you have to keep my office manager who's been with me 20 years and has 80 weeks paid vacation that you have to cover. If you have to pay me over five years, but I want goodwill that you have to deduct over 15. All these things impact what? The buyer's profitability. Same, so you, it's not the seller's net that makes you attractive. It's what the buyer is going to net out of it. And let's come to rates now. Very recently, I had a two-partner firm in Texas. Very unusual. Two partners did all the heavy lifting. Every other staff was basically a glorified bookkeeper. A firm went in to, to do due diligence and called me up and said, look, we got a big problem. These partners are only getting 200 bucks an hour. We get $300 an hour. So I said, you just did do did your due diligence, other than holding the client's hands, your firm, as a successor firm, has managers, seniors, juniors. What staff would you assign to do the work that these two partners are doing? 
And they said they'd assign seniors. I said, what's your senior billing rate? They said 135. I said, I guess they're getting 200 now. So even billing rates have to be converted. If, it is, if my technology is going to allow me to take less time and effort to derive the fees, if I could leverage the work to, down to staff, it could be the opposite. Maybe you're doing audits and having one person review them from beginning to end, and my quality control process is more robust, and I need more time and effort to derive the fee. So when you're looking to be an attractive seller or a buyer that's trained, is not going to look at what your billing rates are on paper, not what your profit is on paper. They're going to convert what it is. They're going to look at your staff and say, who's got skill sets that's going to be around to help me? Or am I going to have to replace staff and the owners? Is the deal cash flow positive? How much am I going to have to invest into technology to get them onto our platform? Do they have advisory services? If they do, it's obviously more interesting. Do I have confidence that the clients are transitionable? Is the seller going to be an asset in the transition or a block of the transition? The more faith I have that the clients are going to be retainable through a proper transition, the more value I place in the practice. And of course, knowing the scope of services, what are you providing your clients? What are you not providing your clients that I can? And how what you're providing will be impacted by technology in the near future. All of these things are part of what makes a, a seller more or less attractive. But a merge is very different. A merge is a marriage. We spend more waking time with our partners than our spouse. So a merger culture becomes a much more critical aspect of it. You know, I've been often asked why certain merges fail. I will tell you they almost never fail over the economics of the deal. If they fail, it's usually a culture issue, that the cultures didn't match, that the organizational structures didn't make sense with each other. How we served our clients, one firm that everything was paperless, everything was on the cloud, everything was virtual, another firm was very hands-on. How our partners' issues addressed, the key document there is the ownership document tells you how decisions are made, how we admit new partners, how we buy out partners. You know, culture is a big word, and it could, we could spend an hour talking about different aspects of culture. But my partner, Terry Putney, he always wanted a partner smarter than you, and I've got a partner smarter than me, once took a complicated topic as culture and converted it into three questions. What's it like to be a partner in that firm? What's it like to be a staff person in that firm? What's it like to be a client in that firm? And how do they match up? Are they both embracing technology or one is? How do they match up? Certain cultures, as I'll discuss briefly short in a moment, are very hard to mix. It's hard to mix an eat what you kill firm where someone's paid on their book of business with another firm that has not, doesn't have my client, your client, or books of business. They're all firm clients. How do the cultures match up? I mean, metrics still count. The numbers still have to make sense. Having strong benches make, make you more interesting. But culture is the biggest part. And certain cultures just blend well. Certain ones don't. This brings us to if you're thinking about selling or buying a practice, how most sales are structured. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'd say one of, the, one of the ways you'll see often done in the country is a straight sale. What I mean by a straight sale is I'm not looking to stay on to be your partner. I'm not looking to work for the next 10 years. I'm hopefully willing to stay on to do a proper transition, but I'm looking for a straight sale. That's not the majority of the, the 800 plus deals I've been involved in, but it certainly is a type of deal that you'll see. Another type of deal that you'll see is a merger to a buyout. That's where, let's say I'm 200,000, the seller's 800,000, the, the combined firm's a million dollars. For me to be a 50% equity partner, I needed 500,000, so I buy three and then I buy the other five later. Or a merger to buy out without a sale at the initial stage where we're just merging together and we have a buyout plan. What's interesting that's been increasing, not to the majority as the fourth bullet point will be the majority of the deals I'm touching. But there's a lot of new call-out and carve-out types of sales. There's three main types. For example, in, in California, we had a firm doing a lot of wealth management that also had an accounting practice. 
this this woman who owned this practice loved the wealth management, despised the accounting deadline n nature of the practice, but felt one was a springboard for the other. We ended up bringing them to a firm that had high net worth individuals that wasn't doing wealth management. They saw the woman sold the right to do the accounting and tax traditional compliance work to the buyer and signed a non-compete in doing it. The buyer signed a non-compete in wealth management. They held it out to the world as a merger of, of, of specialties where not one person could stay on top of the constant Trump changes in the tax laws and be on top of the changes in the stock market. So we merged so that one could focus on A and one could focus on B. A very compelling argument that worked very well. But this was a cull out where they kept a niche and sold the traditional practice. I've seen people do the opposite, sell the niche uh, and keep uh, sell the niche and keep the traditional one, or vice versa. Forgive me. So that's one type of call out sale. Another type is, for example, in Atlanta, not too long ago, I had a sole practitioner doing seven hundred thousand. Didn't want to stay on as a partner or anything like that. But what he really wanted to do was keep his hands dirty a little bit during busy season. He took a hundred thousand of his oldest best friend clients and said, look to the buyer, you buy the other 600,000 plus worth of my clients. I'm gonna cull out these 100 to keep for, for a little while myself. I'd like to have the use of your software, which I'll compensate you for to manage these clients, and I'll give you the first right of refusal to buy them out. But it left a little bit of a, of a cushion for them to do. The third type is, some firms have so much problem managing internal succession, they cannot find enough partners, they don't want to merge up, they end up culling out the basement of their practice to sell. You know, with $3 million firms, 20% lowest paying clients are probably some of the better clients for a sole practitioner. So briefly, those are the three main ways you'll see a cull out sale. But most of the deals I'm involved in are a two-stage deal. A two-stage deal is designed for a practitioner who wants to start a transition plan, wants to have a succession plan, but still has several more years they want to work full-time, maintain reasonable control, income, and autonomy. So I'm going to walk you through a simple example done with a sole practitioner very, very recently in our Chicago office. It's a small firm doing 500000 including perks, benefits, and the kid's cell phone. They were making 40%. They wanted to work three more years full-time before they slowed down. The buyer said to them, look, right now you're making 40% of what comes in, putting in a certain amount of gross and chargeable hours. Come in with us. We'll take over all of your overhead. We'll pay all the bills. We'll supply You put in the same time and effort you put in the past, and I'll pay your entity 40% of what comes in as a consulting agreement. By paying it to the entity, the seller still was able to have the advantages of pre-tax dollars, of, of paying the car lease and the medical insurance and everything else. So during these three years, it looked like a merger. The clients were introduced to each other. The seller was basically kept whole in income. The buyer saved on synergies that were created from rent, from a clerical person that wasn't retained, and from software. So the buyer got some level of compensation during those three years to help offset the fact that they're investing time into the transition. None of it came out of the seller's pocket. And at the end of the third year, when the seller retires, that's when the buyout will commence. I can't keep you whole in income and pay you for your equity at the same time. So by deferring one for the other, I'm able to maximize a seller's compensation for working and maximize the value of their practice. It's also a great way of, uh, uh, it's kind of like a practice continuation agreement on steroids. So everybody kind of wins. The retention is going to be much better. So the seller is going to get paid for their years of sweat equity. The buyer is going to keep the clients and make more money. It's been a home run for everybody. So a two-stage deal is designed mainly for partners that are one to five years from, from slowing down. And if you understand these alternative deal structures, then when you come into a three-partner firm where one is looking for an immediate sale, one is looking for a two-stage deal, and one is looking to stay on for 15 years, you have the ability, instead of trying to get everybody on the same page, of allowing each partner to have their own choice, merge with one firm that structures three different types of deals. 
So again, the partner leaving, we do an immediate sale for. The partner who wants to gradually slow down, we do a two-stage deal. And the 45-year-old, we exchange equity in their firm for equity in the successor firm. Another big trend that we're seeing that challenges some M&A deals is the one firm culture. One firm culture kind of eliminates the my client, your client. They're easier to transition because the clients aren't married to one person. Your equity and compensation are not tied to a book of business. And it doesn't stop someone from wanting to transition a client. So for example, if I'm an expert in real estate and you pick up a real estate client, it makes more sense that I handle that client. But if you're paid by the book of business you manage, you don't want to transfer that client to me. All this disappears, this my client, your client, and silos that are created disappear. But it's a very hard culture to merge with an eat what you kill unless the eat what you kill is ready to, to make a change. I don't want to dwell on a one firm culture because so many of you are sole practitioners, it doesn't apply. I will say to you that the larger the firm, the more likely you are either pushing to become or already are a one firm client culture. Another thing that I won't invest a lot of time because of the age, the fact, again, we have a lot of sole practitioners is the meaning of equity is being diminished every day as well. As a sole practitioner, I'm the only equity owner. It doesn't impact me. But as multi-partner firms, equity used to impact succession, decision-making, voting, buying, selling the practice, retirement, how compensation worked. Firms are getting away from equity being a big factor. Very recently, I, did a, I reviewed an ownership agreement for a five-partner firm. In that firm, it was one partner, one vote. So if you had 80% or 1% equity, it didn't change anything. It was uh, the, the profit sharing was based on a formula, not based on equity. And your buyout was based on compensation. So in that case, equity had very little meaning. In other firms, equity means a lot. You need to decide what equity means before you look at a merger or, or acquiring a firm to make sure that the cultures are going to make sense and catch up with each other. Before we run out of time, I want to talk a little bit about these values dropping and both on buying out partners and buying out external practices. Part of the reason the values are dropping is supply and demand. There's so many baby boomers bringing their practice to the marketplace, so many buyers growing organically that their, their interest in buying your firm is less than it used to be. You'll still get well paid but it's gonna to have to be structured lower valuations, longer payout periods, less money up front than in the past. A lot of buyers are much more selective because they can be. Larger firms who, who might be the three, four, five partner firms on the phone with us today's target, a lot of them are less interested in being your successor. If one or two partners are leaving, that's okay, but if the whole firm's leaving, they're looking for talent. They're looking for people to stay on. Those larger firms have their own partners that are retiring. So the interest has been diminished in many areas of the country. Not all. And again, you don't have to be Santa Claus, but those one and a half times days are all but ended. Buying out partners have changed a lot too. Some still buy out a partner based on the book of business. Some do it on equity. The smaller firms tend to do it either based on equity times a multiple or book of business times a multiple. But most larger firms now base it on compensation. For example, they'll look at your last five years income on an accrual basis, take the three highest years, average them out, and multiply that by two and a half times and pay it over 10 years based uh, on a deferred comp type of thing. So larger firms are now tending to value equity based on a compensation-driven formula, usually two to three times average comp. Smaller firms are basing it more on equity or book of business managed. It doesn't matter which one you use as long as it passes the litmus test. The litmus test is partner A is looking to retire. How much does she or he make? Subtract from that replacing the cost of their labor. Subtract from that the purchase price. What's left has to be a positive number or my junior partners aren't going to stay there to buy me out. So this is why most internal sales have longer payout periods to make it cash flow better for the remaining members of the firm and still get to a good number for the partners that are retiring. As you'll see, according to the Rosenberg survey, the larger the firm, the more likely your multiple of comp, 
the smaller the firm, the more likely your book of business or equity ownership percentage. And a huge amount of them are combinations of more than one of these things. Mandatory retirements coming into effect as we come to wrapping up. If I'm going to merge into a firm that has mandatory retirement, I better think about that in advance. If I wanted to work three more years and I'm 64 and they have a 66-year-old retirement age, are they going to be flexible? Um, am I just going to have to surrender the equity, but they'll keep me whole in income and then start to buy out? So making sure if you're the buyer or the seller, how mandatory retirement impacts your deal could be a very important thing to have on your, on your uh, radar. Many times also you have a junior partner. This is where a lot of firms now have created income partners or contract partners. They don't have equity, but at least they still get to maintain the title. You know, if you're a, a million dollar firm and you gave someone 10% equity, somebody else isn't going to make them a partner. And they're going to, but they might make them an income partner. This can help you get a merger or acquisition done because a lot of times it's more the title than it is anything else for people. But keep in mind the modern CPA firm when it is all about value added client services. It's all about evolving from type one work to becoming the, the trusted advisor of your client. Think about what's go, how, how technology is going to impact you in the next five, 10 years. Try and acquire some niches to make yourself more powerful, more marketable. And these are just some of the changes that I can go through in just 50 minutes. This is a three hour class but hopefully the Reader's Digest version will give you something to think about. If you're looking for some additional information, the AICPA's PCPS division is made for small firms. They have a lot of resources on valuing deals, structuring deals, retaining clients, what to look for in due diligence. And on our website under the resource sections are dozens and dozens of articles that are free that will also give you insights onto all these things. Div, uh, I, Tom, I guess we need to uh, close up our business as we've reached our capacity. Sounds good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and launch the uh, third poll question here. So, folks, you should be seeing the final poll question in front of you right now. Uh, in the next five years, my firm is likely to sell, acquire a smaller firm, merge into a larger firm, or not sure. So go ahead and select whichever one best applies to your expectation. Make sure to click the Submit button. Um, to make sure your vote is counted. Uh, and Joel, while we have this poll question open, can you talk a little bit about what do you advise uh, what do you advise firms to do to make sure that they retain clients after a merger or acquisition? Well, the secret is understanding the four fears a client has when they hear about a merger or an acquisition. Is the person I trust still there? Is it going to cost me more money? Do I now have to drive a foreign place to far away place to meet my accountant? And is the staff I'm used to working with still there? So you need to address these things. So for example, if I was to meet someone or write an announcement letter, and let's say I was talking to a doctor client of mine, I might say, Dr. Smith, I want you to know I just merged with Jane and John Doe. They have great expertise in the Trump tax laws, the modern computerization of accounting, especially as it relates to the medical field. I'm still going to be the principal in charge of you as a client. We're operating under the same fee schedule. The same staff you're used to dealing with are part of our new combined ted dedicated team of professionals. And I remain geographically sensitively located here in Philadelphia. First paragraph, I took away all their fears. Now, merger or an acquisition, the message to send to the clients is not the loss of something, but the gain of something. And understanding what they're afraid of and overcoming those objections before they're raised can be a critical part of the client retention. Well, and if if I could uh, jump in for a second here as well, I think a lot of firms tend to under-communicate because they're worried about how clients will receive the news. And I think if you under-communicate, that probably raises those anxieties about those four types of fears as well. Do, do you think there's some truth in that? I think there's gospel truth in that. I think it's really, really important to have a very open dialogue about it. And if it's and remember, especially for all of you on the phone that are small firms, your clients are very loyal to you. Why are they going to go to a stranger instead of the firm that you've decided to affiliate with? So don't be afraid of that loyalty in a moral and ethical way. Take advantage of that of that loyalty by sharing with them 
that the you know, things that they would worry about are still there, aren't going to change are still there. But now we can do more for you. Now we have more technology. We have more services to offer you. So if they really are loyal to you, they're not going to go anywhere. The greater the loyalty between an accounting firm and their clients, the higher the retention rate should be every time. I know it's counterintuitive, but 29 years will tell you we average well over 95% retention, not including clients who died, went out of business, relocated, sold, when people follow the transition plans that we consult on. That's great. Um, so folks, I'm gonna go ahead and close up this poll question here in just about five seconds. So please get your vote in if you haven't already. Uh, Joel, one final question came in from William. What's the average multiple for internally acquiring a retiring partner? I know this depends on many things, but just an average. Well, according to the Rosenberg survey um, and the AICPA's PCPS succession survey, its average is about 0.8. But the reason that's a meaningless number is I wouldn't buy out a partner at 0.5 if I had to write it all cash up front. If I could pay it over 15 years, I might be willing to pay a one time their equity interest in the firm. What's the tax treatment? Is there, how is the capital being repaid? So, for example, if I own 20% of the firm, I probably have 20% interest in the AR and WIP. What about debt that I'm leaving behind? One of the problems that people make a mistake on all the time when valuing a practice, whether you're selling it to a partner or selling it to a stranger, is they, they just look at the multiple. Where the multiple is really the effect, you got to focus on the cause. And there's a couple articles on our website that talk very specifically about valuing partner equity and valuing in an external sale. All right, great. Well, Joel, thank you so much for your time today and your excellent presentation as always. Um, and I want to thank all of the attendees today as well for joining us. Just a reminder, our next expert webinar is in three weeks, Wednesday, July 10th uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Chester Elton from The Culture Works will be talking about workplace kindness and gratitude. Firms are consistently uh, telling us and, and telling industry publications that one of the most important things they're concerned about is employee satisfaction and, and retention. Um, and so Chester really gets to the heart of how you create a workplace that can help to differentiate you in that way uh, with your current and future employees. So if you haven't already signed up for that and all of our remaining expert webinars this year, you can go to 2019webinars.com, 2019webinars.com, and sign up for all of the remaining webinars at once. And just a reminder, I mentioned before Stephen Brewer's case study on how he transformed his accounting practice uh, and took back control of accounting from, uh, from his clients. If you want to read that full case study, uh, go to accountantsworld.blog. So instead of .com, accountantsworld.blog, and you'll see right up at the top a link to Stephen's case study. So I want to thank all of you for joining us again today. And uh, again, Joel, thank you so much for your time today. Have a great day, everybody.